verse 15. We left off at verse 15. Wherefore I also, so Paul is saying, uh, Paul is talking about himself. What did he do? After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, after he hears of the Ephesians church, their faith in Jesus Christ, how they've been serving him faithfully, and love unto all the saints. So he also hears about their love for all the fellow brethren, all the saints, saved Christians in Christ around the world. So what did he do after he heard of their faith? Verse 16, cease not to give thanks for you. Cease not. In other words, cease means stop. So he never stopped, what? Get giving thanks for them. How did he give thanks for them? Keep reading. Making mention of you in my prayers. He always mentioned them when he was praying to the Lord, thanking the Lord for these people that at verse 15 of their faithfulness in the Lord and their love for all the brethren. So that's a pastor's prayer. So a pastor's prayer at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 16, it should be common knowledge that the man of God who is preaching out of the word of God, that he would be thanking the Lord for his people. So if you want a pastor to pray for you, there's one thing that you should have the pastor pray for you on, and the thing that he should be praying for you about is basically thanking the Lord for your faithfulness, not your problems all the time. So that's a good prayer that the pastor should be doing. So sometimes you have to ask yourself, do you wonder that your pastor, when he prays, he prays more often about thanking the Lord for the people's faithfulness, or would he basically, be, the pastor, he's praying more concerning about the members' problems that they're going through. So that's something that you should pray and think about. Now, that's one of the important things concerning about the power of prayer. In the power of prayer or in your prayer life, what in, if some of you don't know how to pray, one of the best things that you should be doing is thanking the Lord. Why? Because he's done so much for you that you and I don't deserve. So within the power of a, of a mighty prayer life, you should be thanking God. So that's one of the verses that you should be marking down on the things that you should be doing when you pray to the Lord. So my question to you is how often do you thank the Lord in your prayer life? Or is it only during the meal time that you thank the Lord for the food? In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and that's it. So then, uh, how often are you praying to the Lord, thanking Him? Because the thing is this, why should God answer more of your prayer requests if you fail to thank him? Amen. I mean, God's like thinking, well, you know, the child's ungrateful anyway, is not going to thank me, just begging me to solve problems here and there, and that's pretty much it. So why should I answer his other prayer requests if he's just going to be ungrateful about it, keep whining about his problems to me? Because that's what prayer is. It's Basically, it's almost like you're practically whining to God about your problems. Now, of course, God, he wants that intimacy. Prayer is so important and powerful where that intimacy is demanded, where you disclose all of yourself to him. But I think our problem is that if we keep constantly doing that without thanking him, without then your prayer life is not thanking the Lord. When you're talking to him, all he's going to hear is an ungrateful child when you pray to him. An ungrateful child about problem here, problem there, when, when you haven't said thank you to the Lord one time. On what? Well, that he saved your soul from hell. I think that's something you should thank him every single day. He's given you life. He's given you a Bible-believing church, a book, and he's given you brethren to love and to encourage you. So how often have you been thanking the Lord? Did your prayer realm enter the throne of glory or has it been blocked? Is his throne of glory mer merging with your prayer life? Is the communication merging or is it blocked? As you'll notice from this color here, it's merging. That's what prayer should be. And how it can merge better is 
the relationship connection is better through thanking him. Thanking him. So that should be a part of your prayer life. Let's keep reading verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then there's something that Paul specifically prays for these people at verse 16. He prays for them to receive what? Well, before we find out what it is at verse 17, let's examine the first part of verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's the problem that Jehovah Witnesses might use on you. They'll use verses like this and the book of John where Jesus said, I go to your father, my father, to my God and your God. So the Jehovah Witness tactic is to use verses like that to prove that Jesus himself is not God, but that Jesus Christ himself has a God to worship. So notice in that book of Ephesians, it says the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not that Jesus is God. So notice over here, it does not seem that Jesus and God are the same being. They're more like connected. That's what the Jehovah Witness claim. But no, that's not true. We do know as a matter of fact that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He is God. You might say, well, why is Jesus Christ called God over here? Well, let me ask you this. Why did the Father call Jesus God then? Go to Hebrews 1. Go to the book of Hebrews 1. All right, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Notice what the Father called the Son. He called Jesus God. You might say, why is that? Very simple. The Father is God and Jesus is God. So, isn't it correct that Jesus calls the Father God? And isn't it correct that the Father calls Jesus God? Duh! <laughs> See, Jehovah Witnesses, that's, uh, I always debase and demean cultic heresies because they make, it think, they make you think like that they caught you with their scripture, but actually it's a duh statement. No, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ is simple because to Jesus, the Father is God. Just like to the Father, Jesus is God. Why? Because they're both God. <laughs> I mean, look at Hebrews chapter 1. Look what the Father says. Verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, what does the Father say to the Son? Thy throne what? O God, o God is forever and ever. Oh, I guess the Father has his own God then? I mean, that's nonsensical. All right, go back to Ephesians 1. So remember, when they're trying to use these silly arguments on you, that the Father is God, but Jesus is not God, because why? Jesus says, my God and your God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nonsense, all right? Don't let that scare you. You can find out over here, it's very simple. Simply that... The Father is God. So it is accurate for Jesus to say, God. <laughs> I mean, if the Father is not God, then what is Jesus going to call him, right? Hey, Dad. I mean, what else do you think? It's accurate to call him God. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. So remember, what did Paul mention about the saints in his prayers? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, that's the Father, the Father of glory, so that's self-explanatory, the Father is in His glory, so it's talking about the Father. What does He do? May give unto you the spirit of wisdom. So He's praying that the Father would give the saints, the uh, Christians, a spirit of wisdom. So that's the question that you have is, not only your prayer life should it contain thanksgiving, in your spiritual life you should also include wisdom. So within you, you have a spirit of wisdom, or do you? And then the next one is not just wisdom, but also revelation. 
So, revelation means revealing. Revealing of what? Revealing of in the knowledge of Him. Knowing God. Knowing about God. So, do you have that revelation? Oh, I, I'm an expert on revelation. There are some of these onliners, not all of them, but there are some who can be very prideful and they'll correct Bible-believing preachers who teach dispensational truth from the King James Bible and they'll say, you don't know much about Revelation, so I know more Bible than you. you they don't know what the real... Well, do they have the revelation about God Himself? Or do they know the revelation of when the Antichrist is revealed? I wonder which revelation they're studying more. They're more infatuated with. See, so that should put you under conviction. But a pastor is praying for them, uh, not just thanking the Lord in his prayers for the saints, but he's also praying that they would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Every Bible study, your pastor would pray. When I say your pastor, I'm referring to the people in my church, all right? So there are some nitpicky onliners that says, that, well, it's strange where he says your pastor. Well, it's because I'm talking to my church, okay? Amen. Yeah, so please understand that. Anyways, when we return back over here, the pastor, or your pastor here, he would constantly pray before Bible study. Please, what? Give the members. He's praying for the Lord to give the members the spirit of wisdom. Remember, wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge. And revelation, what? Revealing more about God himself, knowing about God. That's the idea. So is that your Bible study or does your Bible study consist of endless YouTube videos in the flesh where everything is catchy that's not spirit of wisdom revelation that's flesh fleshly wisdom fleshly selection of certain revelation Amen. not something spiritual now here's another interesting thing some people get uh, not just overtly eschatological eschatological meaning study of end times so many people are insistent about end times, but they're also obsessed and intense on devotional. That's important to understand. They think that the idea of spirituality, right over here, the peak of spirituality is, well, you know so much doctrine, but you don't know much about your relationship with Jesus Christ, says some people. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe your spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ is an important thing. And your pastor here, he'll mention so much about people who get so obsessed in heavy meat and doctrine that they overtly look o over the milk, which is about their devotional life with God. But there are people who get stuck on the milk. That's what I'm critiquing. And they major so much in milk, they hardly major in meat of the Word of God. So some of these pious people who get really deep, so listen up, they get so deep into prayer life, for example, and there are some people that I recommend on their prayer life. But when you listen to their subjects, they're totally off on meat doctrine. And they'll sometimes teach wrong doctrine, which is sad, which is sad. So that's why Bible-believing preachers are better recommended for listening on devotional topics. But the reason why I gave the other preachers is because I want to give a recommendation for everybody's perspective. That way they can get a uh, hearing from all sides. But back to the point at hand is that just because you know so much on soul winning and your prayer life and the love of God doesn't make you more spiritual than me. Amen. Doesn't make you more spiritual than a regular Christian who's studying so much of the doctrinal meat of the Word of God. You're both in the same boat actually. The knowledge, notice, is of Him. Did you see that, verse 17? That means all about God. So everything about God is what? I only choose milk, says God. No, it's meat and milk. Oh, I only choose the deep things of the doctrine about the timing of the rapture, the uh, identity of the Antichrist, and yada, yada, yada. No! God also looks at the milk, not just meat. So it's everything. It's everything about him. So, if the pastor prays for you on that one, especially onlineers who are watching me, I wonder how you react to that. Do you reject that spirit of wisdom and revelation that is taught to you? And you get offended and mad that because I don't like the pastor's tone of voice, he's overtly critical about other preachers. He thinks he's all right and everybody is wrong. No. 
you just don't like any preacher that you love being called out. Amen. And no, I'm not the only one that's right and everybody's wrong. There are plenty of preachers of us Bible-believing preachers that I actually heed and listen to and even take correction from. Amen. Well, how come I don't? It's simple. You choose to like popular channels, big channels with big preachers. Yeah. That's not who God is going for. Amen. All right. Who did Jesus go for? The unpopular ones. Usually the preachers are most despised, small channels, small subscribers. Right. If you always go by popularity onliners, guarantee you're going to love the heretical preachers more and you'll stick to those. Amen. Now, that's why it's important that as people receiving the spirit of wisdom and revelation don't reject it, and you should know more about God. How much do you know Him? His dealings, His actions, His workings. We had one sister in Christ saying that her favorite book is Leviticus just because you understand God's character, personality, speech. Leviticus, when you read it, it's all just details of sacrifices and tabernacles. And I still think it's boring because I'm in the flesh. But every detail of how the sacrifice is burned, how the sacrifice should be dealt with, and how many inches and feet and how much gold and silver, all that shows the personality of your divine God. And you understand him. Numbers in the Bible shows your, your God's personality and character. All how he selects numbers, how God does the deep doctrine or the devotional topics. Everything is about your God. Amen. How much do you know him? You, do you know the do deep doctrinal teaching at hand or do you know the mind of God behind it? And that is taught. That's it. That is key. Amen. 